Hello everybody, this is Michael Hollands once again for Sound of the Movies. Today I have the pleasure to be joined by award-winning composer, producer, songwriter and touring artist David Russo. Throughout his career he has contributed to 150 films, TV shows, documentaries and commercials. On this episode we will discuss his career as well as working on the series Gotham and Pennyworth. It is my pleasure to welcome David Russo. Hello. Nice to be here. Thank you for having me. It's great to have you on my show. Thank you very much for joining me today, David. And before we dive right into Gotham and also Pennyworth, I would like to know a little bit more about your musical beginnings and how you started out. And maybe you could tell me a bit about the band which you founded, um, Sun 60 and the LA indie rock scene. Yeah, it was, uh, I, I was here for, um, certainly the, for a lot of it. I, you know, I was here when the punk scene started and that was pretty exciting. And I was part of this kind of this time when they called it alternative rock was kind of had its brief moment in the sun right before kind of Nirvana and Pearl Jam redefined rock so uh let me see well it starts i went to alaska with a bunch of friends uh and then you we took these float planes into the interior and we were there for a couple weeks and then some this ranger gave us some frozen moose meat which i had in the overhead container uh it thawed on the flight home and the blood dripped down onto the head of this woman <clears throat> who proceeded to freak out and um that turned out to be this woman joan jones who i ended up well, first falling in love with and then founding the band with. And we had a, a you know, the, the relationship in the band lasted quite a long, long time. Uh, the band, you know, we did three CDs for Epic. We toured a lot, um, but we had never really sold more than about 40,000 of each CD. But uh, it was a chance to live that life, uh, and tour and have incredible experiences and have that family of being with the band and and, and also expand my understanding of recording and production, which have served me, you know, every day in music. You are a versatile artist, basically. You write music, you have done some engineering, producing, so many tasks. Is there any specific task which you would describe as your biggest expertise? Well, uh, as a musician, I'm best at playing piano, but I, I think I'm a musician of limited ability. I actually think I'm a composer of limited ability. In every aspect of what I do, <laughs> it's limited ability. So my strategy for staying alive, I think, has been to have a very broad skill set. Uh, and also it just it fits my my mind. Like I enjoy, like I was always the guy that was recording the band and producing the band. That's just, I think that's just how my brain works and how I approach music. You know, I'm not a virtuoso at anything, but th those things taken together, give me enough, enough time, I can come up with something that's interesting. And, you know, I've cobbled together a career over these years. Still here, still swinging. <laughs> Great. David, before you got a break in the TV and film world, so to speak. You had also worked with, you know, Rage Against the Machine. You had worked with uh, Rick Rubin, famous big record producer. And also you worked with uh, Sheryl Crow. And um, how would you describe your experience in this line of work and working with those artists back in the day? Yeah, so when I did this work, uh, that was at a time when Pro Tools was relatively new and not that many people had these systems. So I had, uh, by virtue of being in the band and recording and trying to find ways to do that, um, I'd, I'd gotten this system. So after, and through the, my uh, association with the band, uh, hooked up with different producers who then knew my name, I got called in, Rage Against the Machine uh, was trying to, or what the producer was trying to do was use some of kind of this looping technology that people weren't using very much in, in pop music and certainly not in rock and see if he could uh, give their sound, I don't know, a different quality or a punch or just, I don't know, just something to play with. So he brought me in to work in the studio with Rage. Uh, so I'm, I'm just sitting here recording them and creating kind of drum loops, bass loops for them to then overdub onto, which is something they hadn't done before. Through that, I got an association with Tom Morello, who was an absolute genius and um, 
He's one of the kindest, most brilliant people I've ever met. But over a period of time, he did uh, a bunch of remixes for huge movies. You know, so they would give him the original tracks of some Led Zeppelin tune, and then he and I would go into my studio, bring the tracks into my Pro Tools rig, uh, turn off stuff, and he would just start laying down guitar parts, and then we would sit and loop those, manipulate those. And uh, that was really fun. So I did, did that for you know, a couple of years. Uh, and then Cheryl Crow, again, I met through this producer, Nick Didia, who knew Cheryl, who she was looking for somebody to help her in the studio because she was producing um, Stevie Nicks, who had been in Fleetwood Mac. And uh, so I went in there and got to be a fly on the wall. You know, we were working at the studio uh, and she was doing a brilliant job uh, producing this album. And and uh, Stevie Nicks was there with her entourage. And then after she would leave, uh, Tom Petty would sneak into the room and hang out and they would tell stories about Stevie Nicks. And uh, I, you know, I was just the guy in the corner, had a great time. Oh, and then, and then when Cheryl wanted to go on a, a European tour, um, she's kind of a five piece band, but the, of course the album has a lot more going on. So she needed someone to be able to play all the extra stuff that the band could not play and to interface with the video when they wanted to be in sync with video and to add um, background vocals that the band, you know, just all manner of percussion and stuff. So I was kind of the guy behind the, uh, behind the curtains, adding a bunch of stuff for this European tour. And that was really, really fun. When exactly did you start working with uh, Rick Rubin? When did you beat him? Oh, so when I was working with Rage Against the Machine, um, Zach, the singer, started calling me Sugar D. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Which is hilarious because I am kind of like the most suburban white guy you ever met in your life. And so, but somehow, uh, and when, so I think somehow, I don't know how Rick Rubin got my name, but suddenly the phone rings and, you know, hello, can I speak to Sugar D? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Speaking. What can I do for you? And he wanted me to do beats for, um, I think it was uh, for one of the Spice Girls, Melanie C, who was doing a solo album. And he goes, "Will you do beats for the song?" And of course, I will. You know, and then, uh, and that uh, proceeded to uh, extend into a relationship where I worked in the studio with him, uh, recording uh, her album. It was really fun. Um, Rick, very interesting guy, uh, very soft-spoken, not big on eye contact, but you know, just a computer of information and a, a creative powerhouse. Just a an amazing person if i'm not mistaken you had also contributed to um the sean combs or pdd song uh, come with me well again yeah that was uh with tom morello so uh you know working in the studio with him to uh to do a, a complete you know new version remix of that song That's a fantastic song. And of course, I mean, when, I, when I'm thinking about, you know, Godzilla, the um, film which was directed by Roland uh, Emmerich, um, the yeah. David Arnold score yeah. is so fantastic yeah. and it stands out. It's, it's one of David's best, best scores ever, I believe. But they also yeah. produced a, song, a, a soundtrack album and, you know, the, the P. Diddy song, Come With Me, was also featured on that one. And when you're a songwriter, musician, producer, whatever, artist, You listen to this work um, that's come before you, and there's kind of magic in some of these songs. Like, how did they do that? There's that fairy dust, and you can't understand necessarily what makes it so good, but it just is. And for me to get the original tracks of these songs and to uh, be able to listen to them in their unadorned state and to, you know, pull down the guitar and listen just to the, what the drums and bass are doing or what the vocalist is doing by himself, it's, uh, there's something for me that was really special about that. And David, I also yeah. would like to ask you about the work you have done for certain brands in terms of, you know, advertising, you know, you, I, if I'm not mistaken, you have worked for um, Adidas, Coca-Cola, McDonald's at some point, and also Motorola. Um, how did you get involved in the, um, the advertising world? Yeah, well, I haven't done, you know, if you see, I haven't done that many commercials. So it was really tangential. Um, at that time, let's see, I was working, I had a great um, nine year relationship working for a, a New Zealand composer, Graham Ravel. And uh, it was after the band um, exploded and uh, I just met him through a friend and started working um, as his assistant. Through the course of working with him, he had, so he, we were doing five films a year at one point, and he would th he would throw stuff my way all the time, you know, because people would co come to him and say, hey, we need this, and he's, I, I can't do it, I'm too busy. 
but here's a guy I'm working with who's, you know, my assistant and he's talented. Then I would demo and, and I was lucky enough to get a few of those. And that was, um, it was really fun. I love commercials because it's a, a short blast of intense creativity and you do 30 versions and it happens fast. It's a blur, but it's, you know, it's really fun. Focused, you know. Speaking of Graham Ravel, yeah. you have or had worked with him on Gotham. Could you please share some information about your collaboration with Graham and how it all started for this particular project? Well, it starts uh, in 2001 when um, the producer Danny Cannon was doing CSI Miami and he called in Graham to score it. And Graham asked me if I would co-compose with him. So we did it together. And then that started a relationship with Danny that has lasts to this day because I've done five series pilot with Danny. Danny was the showrunner for Nikita, four seasons of that that I did, and then uh, five seasons of, of Gotham. I was doing another show and he hired Graham for the first season of Gotham. And then Graham called me in to say, would do this with me? And I said, I'm in, because it was such an interesting show. And then uh, after the first season, Graham kind of retired and went back to New Zealand. Uh, and so then the, the show was given to me. Before you took on Gotham with Graham Revelle, did you find inspiration by revisiting some of the previous Batman films and or the comic books? You know, certainly it's all in, in my head. I've been an avid moviegoer and, and a fan of, uh, of film scores. So, and I've seen all these films so many times. So it's all in my head, you know, and I really try not to reference it. But I think for inspiration, I only had to look at what was on screen. The, the beautiful thing about this show is how rich and broad it is, how, what a beautiful show it is to look at, the, the performance of these characters. Um, the guys that did Penguin and Riddler redefined those characters. And, uh, and also uh, Sean Pertwee as Alfred Pennyworth. He redefined Alfred. You know, we've never seen an Alfred who has all these military skills, who is, who is so kind of robust and macho and masculine and yet uh, so kind. You know, we've always seen uh, Alfred is kind of a, an older guy who's, you know, he's not fighting anybody. And in Gotham, they redefine that character. And that the, the show is so insane and operatic, just beautifully produced. The production design was beautiful. So everything was on screen uh, for inspiration. I think Gotham is a huge an expansive production, 100 episodes divided into five seasons. And could you please walk me through the process of theme development and how you perceive the characters in the series? Uh, at the beginning of the season, I, I sit down and have a conversation with Danny Cannon, the showrunner. And he's been part of the, the whole concept of um, getting the story arc throughout the season. And and, and uh, talking with these writers who do a brilliant job at reimagining these characters and being true to the DC canon. I, I think it, the, they pulled it off and it was so hard to do. Here you have characters you already know. So they have to do something that's fresh and yet you have to have these characters be relatable to the DC mythology that's already been established. How do you do that? The way they reimagined the origin story for Penguin and for Edward Nigma, I thought was brilliant. And then I just go back to my studio and just start just daydreaming about it, really, you know, that the dog that was just scratching to get into the studio, I walk him a lot and, and that's just, I'm humming to myself, I'm, I'm thinking about just the, the, the spirit of these characters and how can I am hopefully embody the spirit musically? How do I do that? I don't know. I, I, it's just a lot of just daydreaming and I will do I know there's one thing I will do is I'll establish uh, a mu I'll try to establish a musical palette for each character I mean is there a limitation of what sounds I can use for this character or is there a, a touchstone I can find you know so we, we we gravitated toward the symbolom and the dulcimer for for penguin we I gravitated toward some kind of backward sounds for uh, Enigma for Bruce Wayne, certainly, you know, there's another character we, we know so much about trying to find something heroic for him, but he's not a superhero yet. So it's this nascent heroism in him that is 
growing slowly? How do you how do you find something for him? I guess that's ultimately just the role of the composer. You have to sit there and uh, dip your toe into the river of creativity and kind of come up with something. It's always I always feel like with creativity, it's always there. It's you just have to let it flow out of you. You have to access it. I think there would have been a thousand different solutions for these characters. I just happen to come up with these particular ones, and uh, hopefully they work. Sometimes they work better than other times. You know, it's just a constantly moving target. I believe the, um, let's say, anticipation must have been pretty high when Gotham was announced because everybody has a preconceived idea, you know, as far as Gotham is concerned. We have seen it in the movies. We have seen it portrayed in a different way, you know, in the, the Joel Schumacher films. And so I believe people were trying or were, let's say, looking for something different yet familiar and it's essential for the audience to be intrigued by a product and a series and how did you try to guide the audience through the series with your with your music the show is existing at different levels all the time so there's constantly this unrequited love story between jim gordon and lee tompkins that's there constantly you see Bruce Wayne dealing with the murder of his parents and trying to kind of escape that darkness. So it's it's always kind of identifying these story arcs and just trying to support them. And, you know, and, and then suddenly you have uh, Freeze, you know, f uh, with his weapons just freezing somebody and just ma madness. Or you'll have Zaz, you know, carving his own arm and gleefully killing. It's like you have these constant story arcs with these wildly different characters. So just trying to find a way to, to have this three-dimensional chess game moving forward um, simultaneously. Interestingly, the show, I think at the beginning, it was intended to be more of a crime show, you know, like a procedural crime show that takes place in Gotham City. And I think more inspired by, what is it, Gotham Central, those comic, those series of comic books. And then when they got into it, suddenly they realized that... The actor who was portraying Penguin was so strong and the strangeness of Gotham was so entertaining that um, they moved much more toward kind of the original, that, that traditional Batman, uh, you know, Gotham City with these charismatic villains. I don't think it was intended to be, be that from the very beginning. Maybe I'm wrong, but I think that was my impression. When you discussed the music with uh, Danny Cannon and also Bruno Heller, did they have a specific idea what the music should sound like? Were there any limitations in terms of instrumentation or were, were you given a tremendous amount of leeway? Danny gave me complete freedom. The, there was one rule that he didn't want any loops. So nothing where you hold down a key and something repeats. He wanted everything to be performed. The, the show exists kind of out of time. So it looks like 1970s New York sometimes but then there's these weird futuristic things and people are using cell phones but they're also using other antiquated technology so it's it's in this weird place and so for me it was not future although you know when we get into indian hill um then the, the sound is extremely synthetic and processed but for the most part I was trying to do something that was really organic and or brutal depending on the moment and i think it certainly paid off it was a very su um, successful series 100 episodes over five seasons that's a lot considering most series have 10 episodes per season that was a long journey for you i bet <laughs> yeah and at the very beginning with like the press releases for the very first show they said the intention for this show is to show you bruce wayne uh, from the moment his parents murdered or murdered and the very last shot of the very last episode is going to be when he has now become batman and that's when the show ends and that's exactly what they do. And I think, you know, it's thanks to the fans that we were able to go that far. You know, it's it, yeah, it is rare for a series to be able to get that many episodes. But we were able to achieve what they originally set out to do. That was nice. Now I would love to talk about um, Pennyworth. When did the series creators, Danny Cannon and Bruno Heller, mention they wanted to create a story which explores the life of a young Alfred Pennyworth? I think, I mean, it had to have been during that last season of Gotham because 
after Gotham wrapped, we were on to Pennyworth pretty quick. Um, and, Dan, you know, uh, the entire crew of Gotham just moved over to Pennyworth, uh, with post-production side at least. Uh, the, the show was filmed in London, uh, whereas Gotham was filmed here at Warner Brothers in Burbank. Um, but they must have been talking about it for quite a while. And I know they have a great relationship with DC. Um, but, I, you know, credit to Bruno, because uh, Bruno had an idea of this show that an origin story, again, for Alfred that has not been told, but the show itself is not a superhero show, has nothing to do with superheroes. And yet it connects us to those earlier days, you know, and, and the chance to see Alfred meet Thomas Wayne, uh, for Thomas Wayne to meet Martha Kane, who will be his wife. Uh, and yet the story, it's just a political mystery thriller set in a very strange London of the 19 early 60s that has nothing to do with Gotham. And yet if the show lasts long enough, I could completely see there's the thing moving to Gotham, because there's a point at which Alfred's going to move to Gotham. And in, in, in the pilot, he talks, or actually in Gotham, I forget which episode, he's talking to Bruce about how meeting Thomas Wayne and how Thomas Wayne saved his life. Uh, for them to show me that story, I'm really interested to see it. That's also a very good point, which you just made, uh, David, because we know eventually where this is going. But would you say it was a, an advantage or disadvantage at first to work on a show which explored quote unquote familiar characters yet in a different universe? Well, I, I think it was a distinct advantage because you were free. No one knows what a 21-year-old Afrin Pettyworth is like, and no one knows what a, what a young uh, Thomas Wayne is like. So we could, they could, I mean, it has to be consistent with whom they become. But I think it was a distinct advantage because uh, there were very little preconceived notions about what it had to be. And the brilliance of Bruno creating a London that is not the real London. This, it's suddenly this brutal London where they have capital punishment and public beheadings and you know, all this craziness. Uh, I think that was an advantage because it could be free and just go someplace strange and new. It was uh, strange, yes, um, yeah. to, a, to, a, to a certain degree. I mean, we had some pretty wicked characters and also some pretty graphic um, moments in, in, the, in this series. And I remember um, reading certain comments by a couple of uh, people that were actually even offended by some of the violence scenes. When uh, Alfred has sex with the Queen, I thought I actually ha had a conversation with Danny and he directed that episode. I said, has that ever been done before? In a, in a <laughs> I don't think so. And he said that, interestingly, when he went to film that sex scene, he wanted it to be kind of graphic, show them. And he said that um, they really toned it down because he found that the English crew that was shooting it, they were not happy about it. Like, they, it kind of bumped them emotionally. It's like, no, nah, I don't want to see this. I can see that. I mean, I, I, I believe they must have been or could have been offended by that. I mean, it, it certainly it certainly didn't bother me one bit because I know this is a series and it's all fictitious. So, um... But it's interesting that it did bother them, even though it's fictitious. They didn't want to see the queen holding onto the bedpost, you know, with <laughs> being taken a task by a young commoner. They didn't want to see it. Gotham did have a big or biggish uh, main title montage, so to speak, whereas Pennyworth now does have an extensive main title sequence, which you also scored very heroically, even though we are not talking about a hero character. Um, could you shed some light into that as to why Pennyworth was given a big main title sequence and Gotham wasn't? It's interesting. So I've done a lot of shows for Danny Cannon, and he's never had a main title sequence. I think, and you know, we've done all these TV series. There's a constraint in TV where you you don't have that much time to tell a story. So to, for him to give a minute to the main title sequence in, in network TV, you're losing a lot of story time. So I think the feeling was just like get to the point. With epics, this show is there's no commercials, and there was more time. So I think for the first time he said, oh, I, would, I want to do a main title because we have time for it. And I don't feel that pressure of having to lose story to have a main title. So uh, it was fun. You know, he and he um, I mean, why it's heroic? Uh, well, I think Alfred is I think Alfred's a wonderfully heroic guy. 
And you see over the course of, I mean, certainly his, his morality and his loyalty to Bruce Wayne is phenomenal. You know, he's a second father to him and his love, but his loyalty and his, and his, his heroism. And this young man, he has all those qualities. Um, if he, and he's, even though he's a bit of a complicated character in that he's murdering people and, you know, he's not a saint, but he still has that, that heroism. Oh, and, and also, and that theme, I was trying to come up with a theme for Alfred, and that theme seemed to kind of, for me, express his character. And I use it all throughout the, the series uh, in, in a lot of different ways, with, you know, with playing it with bass flutes, playing it with horns. It's like it kind of seemed to work in a lot of different venues or, or, or reorchestrating it in a more minor vein and not so positively heroic. It just it seemed to work. And then Danny, he uh, there was a movie in the 90s, I think, with Robert Downey Jr. and Val Kilmer called Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. He always loved the main title sequence for that. So he went and found that artist and had him design that main title with all those that same kind of imagery and that sepia stuff and all the crows flying around and the dissolves. And the, so it just came out really nice. I, I love that thing. When you are uh, presenting a series on a network, of course, some people, well, they may want to skip the main title and switch to a different station. But, you know, as in terms of streaming services, for, for instance, you can skip the main title anyway. So I've always en greatly enjoyed a main title sequence and a main title cue for a TV series because I feel it's like a calling card. It sets the tone for uh, for the series. So I'm always a little disappointed when a show or a series just doesn't have a main title and they just just they they just present a logo so you know gotham it's an hour show it's 42 minutes after all the commercials and that's and that's not a lot of time it's tight you know like for the the finale episode god i would have loved 20 more seconds for that last shot of uh, panning up to batman on the roof of the building but we know it's not that long because there was a lot of story to tell and you know you're the clock ticks and then you're out so you can't extend it's it's that's the one thing it's a it's tough about TV. There's there is a, a time constraint, and you have to um, prioritize as to you know which scenes you would like to expand on, and which you want to to cut, and which you want to score, and which you do not want to score. So I believe that's a, a very tough decision to make. In in terms of um, Pennyworth, I realized that, um, for instance, in the queue called Alfred and Esma Love Theme, oh. you also used the um, the trumpet. Did you use this as a reference to Alfred's military past? You know, for me, it was more of a nod to the movie Chinatown. The There's that kind of erotic, steamy jazz score that Jerry Goldsmith to, uh, did for Chinatown that was a direct inspiration for me. Chinatown is a good reference and mm -hmm. I also believe that you gave the scene a certain um, film noir atmosphere. Yeah, and, and I love that stuff. Uh, we did that in Gotham when, with uh, Sophia's character. We did that for her too. Sophia Falcone, she had a bit of a noir theme. Uh, Barbara in Gotham, she had she went a bit noir as well, especially when she, um, I think it was in season two when she went insane was trying to marry Jim. <laughs> I don't know if you recall when she kidnapped him and then she's in I some do, yeah. white wedding dress and ends up falling out the window. Yeah, well, I, I love noir, so it's whenever oh. I can go there, it's fun. Yes, I mean me too. I um, I mean first of all, I think the trumpet is such a great instrument, especially when it comes to you know scoring film noir. And there are also so many great great movies. You know Chinatown being a prime example, and oh, yeah. L A Confidential and so many others. Did you have a favorite or most inspiring villain character in uh, in Pennyworth? Oh, I think Beth Sykes. Uh, she's so interesting because she's an innocent and she's a psychopath. You know, she's, you know, you can hurt her feelings. Her whole thing in the pilot episode is that Esme hurt her feelings. That's why she's willing to shotgun her parents because Esme hurt her feelings. Uh, and her loyalty to Lord Harwood, I, I, her character is just fantastic. And that that um, Paloma Faith, uh, she's a British pop singer who, who uh, played the character, She's just interesting all the time. Everything, every scene she's in, she's just interesting to me. 
that's a good that's a good example i mean she's she, she was a very interesting character and she of course she was she was a psycho she she was nuts but then again her her sister was was no saint either you know <laughs> no, it's great i mean the scene where the two sisters are fighting and the older sister almost chokes her to death when you know when uh, beth sykes hits her in the back of the head with a radio because you know remember the she's playing the radio too loud and the sister wants her to turn it down and then it just she ends up almost choking her to death just to assert her dominance. <laughs> That's yeah, I loved it. The sister relationship taken to kind of that that uh, operatic heights. Oh, absolutely. And but one one of my favorite characters of the show was uh, Martha Martha Kane. Actually, you also wrote a very kind of charming, sexy theme for for her. Could you please discuss with me the essence of, of, of her character and also Tom Wayne? You know, again, we don't know anything. As Batman fans, we don't know anything about Martha Kane, right? We just know she gets shot and drops her pearls. That's all we know about her. So suddenly you have this plucky American woman, highly moralistic, and, and also Thomas Wayne, who's a little wobbly. You know, he's a little shifty, that Thomas Wayne. Uh, not only is he a CIA agent, but he's kind of a... He's kind of weak-willed compared to Martha Kane, so that was a completely new dynamic. Um, that was really fun to score. So yeah, her her pluckiness was really good. Her morality. The characters in the series they are still young, and of course we know you know um, Thomas Wayne as the um, the billionaire entrepreneur, and of course we we don't know how he got there. So of course in in, in uh, Pennyworth he was kind of as you just said wobbly, and I'm sure. There will be lots of character development as the season will, or as, as the series will uh, continue and progress. Yeah, remember, in the, I think in the end of the first season of Gotham, we discover that Thomas had this secret Batcave, uh, that, what will become the Batcave. And he was doing, we don't know what he was doing. You know, he had this secret stuff going, this secret life. And here in Pennyworth, we see that he's a CIA agent. So it'll be interesting to see where they go with that. Again, a story that has not been told. I must say, stylistically speaking, for me personally, episode number six was the most interesting one. Some people may call it disturbing. You now the whole devil worshiping. That was good stuff. <laughs> yeah. Like what? Yeah, it's so funny. Like, what the hell is this? Suddenly there's a six-eyed goat. Yeah, where did that come from? Really good stuff. Oh, and when Thomas Wayne... Uh, almost kills that uh, the Ripper's son, and it, and it's brutal. That, yeah, it was interesting, it was such a strange turn uh, when we discover that beast inside of Thomas Wayne, you know? And that to me, that relates to the ultimate darkness inside of Bruce Wayne as well, and then fighting that darkness. So that beast was in there, and, it, and that uh, Crowley brought it out. That was a magnificent uh, episode of the first season that was really really good stuff and also in terms of you know cinematography and the whole atmosphere and the and the party and uh, that was really something else and to me one of the uh, standout moments of the first season yeah for me too uh, also the way martha kane wakes up naked in that field it's just very interesting yeah, she she woke up on a Monday morning and the party took place on a Saturday. Yeah, that was yeah, one hell of a party. Yeah, must have been quite something. Yeah. Um, and David, uh, I've got a different question. Many actors say that playing the villain is always more interesting or or attractive than playing the good guy. And um, how do you um, perceive this as a composer? Do you feel the same way when it comes to scoring, or what's your take on that? Interestingly, I think um, to write a theme for the bad guy, you know, like if we take, you know, like the Jerome and the Maniacs in Gotham. I think it's easier because you, you have you can you have more at your disposal. But if you have to come up with a very simple emotional theme, that can be more difficult because the economy of it. Uh, if you only have piano strings and harp and you have to say something that isn't just a recapitulation of what everyone else has always done, already done, that's a, that's not easy. You know, the villains, you've got the kitchen sink and the whole toolbox and you can go to a lot more stuff. But I found economy is more difficult or minimalism more difficult david is there anything else you would like to add in terms of you know your scoring duties on gotham or pennyworth anything else that comes to mind 
all I would say is I, I'm eternally grateful to the fans for supporting it and that they gave us five seasons of that show. Um, uh, same with Nikita. Nikita was a great show, four seasons of that show, uh, because the fans supported it. So I just still feel so lucky to be able to make music for a living. Uh, so and, and without people supporting these shows, it would be it wouldn't be happening. So I get to make music every day, and I'm blessed. And it's because people support these shows. So thanks to the fans. That's it. Right. Um, David, what's actually next for you? What are you currently working on, if you can disclose that? Uh, a couple things. Uh, uh, there's a, a playwright up in San Francisco who's a brilliant madman, uh, this guy Robert Mailer Anderson. I've done two films for him, but he, right now we're working on a radio play. He wrote a, a play that is really timely for what we're going through right now. So we're in the midst of, of uh, getting that, recording that and uh, fleshing it out and scoring it and bringing it to, uh, I don't know where we're going to bring it, but it's going to be an interesting project. And then I also I scored a film a few years ago um, a fascinating documentary called The Elephant in the Living Room. That's a, that's a uh, an expose on exotic animal ownership in the United States and how it always goes wrong for the animals, how it's always tragic for the animals. And uh, he's doing a follow-up to that now called The Conservation Game, uh, the filmmaker Michael Weber. Who, and it's a, he's a brilliant documentarian. So uh, I've been contributing to that. David, thank you so very much for taking so much time out of your schedule. I really had a blast talking to you and I hope you enjoyed the conversation as well. I really did. Thank you, Michael.